welcome to the show. Yeah. The new... How you doing? Doing pretty good. How about you? I am good. Page 109. I saw it as you zoomed in. Yeah. This page is taking a long time. Yeah. That's a great um, audience scene you, you got going there. Yeah. And a lot of detail. Yeah. I, I love the blonde hair juxtaposed by the blue hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I got some green mohawk. Some green, a green mohawk, uh -huh. a green shirt over to the left. Yeah, looking great. Yeah. I'm gonna, I, gotta, right. I still got to put uh, pictures in these circles and then put the um, power, the energy around all the characters that are flying. Gotcha. And uh finish this color coloring these yeah. guys. <clears throat> but yeah. Looking good. Looking good. Yeah, it's it it is looking good. It's just like like I said, it's taken taking a while. So we were just talking before we got on, um as we as you work on this page, um you were saying we should do a Rush 2112 yeah. concept album. Yeah, just, um, and, a, yeah, like, where it's, a, it's just a Adam Split story that's just music with no comedy. So you wouldn't draw anything? I would probably draw, I mean, I'd probably... Draw, like, a cover for it or something? Yeah, a cover. Yeah, okay. And, but that's it. Huh. All right. Well, I am not super familiar with, with the record. Um, I'm only familiar with the big hits by Rush, but that sounds pretty interesting. So I just looked it up on, uh, on Wikipedia, and let's see. Alex Leifson gets the guitarist questioned the musical direction the band was taking at the time and said, what are we going to do? Are we going to try to make another mini Led Zeppelin record? <laughs> Or are we going to do what, we, what we're going to do and continue forward no matter what happens? So that's pretty funny. Well, that's what they were, everybody was saying. They're the uh, Canadian Led Zeppelin. Yeah, okay. And, um, and I guess, I mean, that's why I like them. I mean, but... Okay. But... but uh, I can't. I can't remember if twenty one twenty was a disaster or it was just like decent. No, I think according to this, um, it's listed in the one thousand and one albums you must hear before you die. Yeah. Okay. And it's, 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 yeah. So it's been reissued several times with the fortieth anniversary edition in two thousand sixteen. It right. peaked at number five on the Canadian album charts, number 61 in the Billboard top LPs. So by the time my my cousin who got me into rock back in the 70s, this was already out, he he, uh, he showed me, I think it was Exit, Exit Stage Left maybe was the Rush record that I first saw, and, and this was probably already out. So. So, so, so you were saying it's a kind of a concept about a, a story? Yeah, it's been a long time since I, I I listened to it, but it's about like a city that doesn't have any music or um anything like that. Any kind of I guess it's like a city without any art of any kind. Mm -hmm. And then um this guy that's in the city like escapes and goes out, you know, like out into the Guys, this is like the woods, or um, wow, is or like a desert. Anyway, he finds a guitar, and then he he comes back and brings rock to their non-rocking lives. So, how did you first get exposed to this? I got it. The you got the tape at Record Bar back in the day, or no, something. Yeah, I got the record from the library. <laughs> That's cool. But I mean, I was like, I didn't know. What what was really going on? I was just I I read about it later. Like I didn't, you know, I was like a little kid. Yeah. So I didn't really realize it. It was all about what it was all about. But um. 
but I, cool. I I'm gonna uh I'm gonna eventually re listen to it. No, I'm definitely gonna do it now. Because I mean it's gonna be one of my Spotify things is to listen to all of the rushes. Yeah. So, because I like I like Rush. I'm not a huge fan, but uh, I do like them. So. Yeah. No, I do too. I mean, I'm not. Obviously, they're way more technical musicians than most people. So. Yeah. But that's a whole different audience than I was ever into, and and they interestingly opened for for my number. Uh, did I tie my favorite bands in the la- in the last one? One or two. For Kiss, back when they were first getting going, they opened for Kiss when Kiss was just getting really big uh, uh, numerous times, and uh, they got along good. Most of the acts that opened for Kiss got kicked off because they they were just, I don't know, what for whatever reason, but Rush, I think they realized was so good, and they respected them, and they, they respected each other, so they uh, they stayed on as the opening act until they got big themselves, so pretty little sidebar interesting there. Yeah, um, I think I did. There was a documentary about Rush on Netflix, and um, they said uh, that they said that about Kiss, and I think like Mm -hmm. Rush wanted to go out after the shows and party, but Kiss was not like (laughs) into drugs or alcohol. Well, at least half of them weren't, but half of them was. Yeah, half of them, and uh. So they didn't really hang out that much, but they, yeah. And then Rush was on tour with Aerosmith, and uh, mm-hmm. Aerosmith, uh, the first time, and they opened for Aerosmith, and Aerosmith treated him real bad. And, yeah. And then uh, they did, like, a co-headliner or something years later, and... um and uh, Rush was like, or Getty Lee was like, how are you doing? And is there, are you, you know, I'm going to make this a real good experience for you because that's not what you did for me. <laughs> yeah, I think they're really good people, so. Yeah. Um, now that the, this, I'm looking at Wikipedia, not the Starman logo. Um, I, rem- I hear your dogs. That was a cool part. Of I remember Rush. Like there's a star and then there's a naked guy standing in front of it. So you remember that at all? The abstract man against the masses. The star rep- uh, symbolizes any collectivist mentality. Oh wow, well, that could be appropriate today, couldn't it? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I remember people had that T-shirt back in the day. That's really cool. Right, you're the, so, the 20, 21, 12 album cover. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We'll, have to, we, we'll have to come up with something like that if we pull this off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think the, the coolest thing that I like about Rush is that they had um, washing machines or dryers on stage. <laughs> like in the back line, just doing laundry or something, right? Was that in the documentary? Remember that? No, I don't remember that. Oh, yeah. So, like, their stage setup has, you know, they got marshals or whatever, and then they got washing machines just doing laundry. (laughs) Why? Oh, I don't know, because they have a sense of humor. Okay. And I can Google that. Um, man. Yeah. There's a picture of Getty Lee uh, with the washing machines back there. <laughs> uh, and I think that's awesome. Yeah. So they had, a, they had a sense of humor, too, so that's good. Yeah, that, yeah they, uh, I get, well, I didn't really know that they they had a sense I guess um, I should have from, like, the documentary. Maybe that was something I didn't remember about them from that documentary, but I just mm-hmm. know that, like, when I was in high school, one of my good friends was way into Rush and other bands that were progressive rock, and yeah. he was, like, he was, like, really super smart at math and stuff, 
and this, <laughs> this band's like appealed to him because of uh, something about their music. They, I mean, something about their music has a lot to do with math. I can't really remember, but it it has something to do with math, and math people like it. Yeah. Well. Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech people. <laughs> play a lot of yeah, no, I like and pro programmers. I've had I've had programmers who worked for me who liked math rock. So okay, uh -huh. yeah, interesting. So all right, let's go from Rush to uh, what's the next topic? Well, I read uh, I don't know how long ago that um, maybe a week, maybe a week and a half. Slash said he's happy, or he's not, he doesn't have a problem with Rock being underground again. Uh, what, do you, I, what, I, what do you think he means by that? I would totally agree with that. Um, Slash saying that he doesn't have a problem that Rock goes underground, because how else do people like us have a chance of getting to fans, you know? And in fact, I was thinking what we do is, is pretty much, I've been thinking this for probably two or three years now, is is, is back to underground. So there's got to be, you know, I, I, I hopefully, and, and as we've seen, there's a niche underground market for people who, for fans who like the, what what we do. So it's not super pop, it's not top 40, it's not, you know, Number one, and I, I think that's cool. So yeah. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. But when, okay, but when was um, Rock Underground before? Well, I think it depends on the genre, probably, because, you know, each little subgenre sub has been probably underground until whatever record executive found it and whatever people called the right radio stations and pulled the right strings to get it on. So, I mean, I don't know. You went from 50s pop to 60s pop and then the 70s to slightly al AOR, album-oriented rock, began to leak in. And then, uh, I mean, how did heavy metal... And, and glam rock breakthrough so it was discovered and it was underground up until that point right so that's what I I feel like is okay go back go back underground <laughs> I don't mind mm, okay yeah I didn't I didn't really I didn't get what he was because I guess like what he was talking about is um I mean you can't sell three million albums but you could sell Thousands, you know. Yeah. There's got there's got to be uh, thousands of fans out there out of the millions of people, billions of people in the world who like the particular genre of rock that you know you're doing. Whether they're old or young, or they they're just coming up and they're discovering it, or they're they're old fans. I, I think that's I think that's good. I'm glad I'm glad to hear you said that. Yeah. I mean, you can't obviously you can't get you can't get super uber rich and retire on it and fa super famous but I, you know who cares that's fine <laughs> yeah i mean it, it'd be it's a job so you just, right you know it's and, and, and as an artist just having people like your stuff you know validates it so yeah i think that's worth it yeah i was, I was just wondering when i guess but then I started thinking about it, and I guess, like, when I was in elementary school, rock was not, it was more like the, the things most people were listening to was, um... Probably top, or golden radio, or whatever. Yeah, like Michael Jackson. Yeah. And MC Hammer, I, guess, I don't know, yeah, things like that, so... Um, I was just like, I was just trying to think, like, when was rock? When did album-oriented rock, um, hit? 
It's a good question. I mean, you know, obviously the Beatles took rock and roll to the mainstream back in the late 60s, or you know, so. But after that, when did more serious stuff like Zeppelin and stuff hit? Mm, Zeppelin was like... Mid-70s. Mid-70s. Yeah. But, but, okay, so, if you want to talk about serious rock, um, we should probably talk about a loss that rock had just recently, which is Marty Balin from, um, Jefferson Airplane. Mm Mm-hmm. And I'd say that's serious because they were around when... Everyone was protesting right. Vietnam, and when you you know when you were playing, I guess people felt like when they played music, they had an obligation to to either pro be you know protest it or not protest it. Like you could take Jefferson Airplane and. A lot of their songs, like Volunteers or Good Shepherd, are obviously about the war, you know. Right. Then you can. Right. Then you can. You take. Uh, um. Oh man. So. You take uh, some. Um. Who's that guy that used to... Uh, you need to, like, edit this, because I, I gotta look this up. Yeah. <clears throat> Merle Haggard. You take somebody like Merle Haggard, and he was doing pro-soldier s- songs, I think. I think, uh... Or s- other people were doing, and Elvis were kind of doing pro... America pro soldier songs. Yeah. There weren't nearly as many of them though as there were protest music. Right. So kinda like today only there's really no protest music, it's just protest people. Yeah, protest people. Or people protesting. And people protesting. They're not really writing songs about it. But. Yeah, I, and I, I've read that before. It's like, where's all the protest? Where's all the protest music for the for this generation of protesters? Right. And it's not. Really... It's not like you have to. It's not like you have to. Do, you know, you don't. I don't know. You, you don't have maybe, to answer. Maybe it's out there, and we just don't know it. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um. I don't. You know, Eminem did that protest against Trump song thing. Right. He was like, "If you, if you, like, if you voted for Trump, I don't want you to listen to my music." And then he he also did a song. So there are there is some protest music against Trump. But not like, not like, not like the not like, 60s, the yeah. 70s. Yeah. Yeah, not like that. Not like every band and festivals of bands. I think that's a whole topic in itself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, um, back to Marty. So, so, did he write any of the hit songs from the 80s? I think he was a co-writer. Co-writer, okay. From the eighties. Like when they when they really broke through after all the protests and they you know we built this city and all that stuff. Yeah, when it, and they changed their name to Jefferson Starships. Right. And then and then they changed their name to just Starship. Right. I don't know. I don't know how long he hung around with him. Um. And I'm not really a big fan of Jefferson yeah. Airplane, but uh, there are some songs that I really do like, like Good Shepherd and Volunteers. I really don't like um, 
the rabbit song. Wait, no. No. No, nah, I just, I think it's weird, and I don't, yeah, I don't really like it, but, they, you know, it's a loss, I mean, he, he did a lot for, for rock. Yeah. That, yep. that band did a lot for rock. Yep. So, so it's a, you know. I have a gray slick G. Clay painting here at the house. That she painted. That, that she painted, yeah. That's got the 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 white rabbit in it and all the Monterey Pop Festival people in it. It's pretty interesting. Which I'd love to get rid of. So if anybody wants to buy it, just email me at Adam Smith. <laughs> Where did you get it from? Her? Uh, no, I got it from the gallery that she distributed through. I don't know, eight or ten years ago. And I have it's like a signed dedication to me from it and stuff. Do you, I mean, do you, you like Gray Slick? Not, not really. Yeah. What happened was I bought Paul Stanley, and then I went back to pick it, pick up the, my Paul Stanley paintings, and Gray Slick had been there, and they had these Gray Slicks for sale, and I, I fell into the sales spiel, and I ended up buying a Gray Slick and bringing that home. So I had Paul Stanley and Gray Slick. <laughs> That's what happened. <laughs> so, it's available for purchase if anyone likes. Yeah. Well, maybe <laughs> somebody will take you up on it. Uh. Yeah, it's got everybody smoking, uh, smoking in it. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Though everybody's got a little something in their hand, which is not my thing and not my style, but I don't know why I bought it. But hey. That's a great cartoon, kids. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. What, what are we up to here? We're up to 28 minutes. Let's play a song. All right. So we got the remix album coming out soon. And we're going to play, if I can get my mouse to it, a track off that. We're going to talk about that next time. Um, meanwhile, Mike's going to draw page, was it 106? 109. 109, I'm sorry. All right, so we got, we got Adam Split Super Spin coming up. It's already on, uh, uh SoundCloud's going to be on, um, everything else within probably two weeks. So let's go with the, what I think is probably the, uh, one of the top, is the confession dance mix, which I call danceatory mix, and this is four four minutes and eighteen seconds, and it's the dance mix of confession off of um, Microstar. Cool, ready? Yep. All right, here we go.
Confession, dance interior mix. Yeah, that sounds good. That um, I like how it builds up at the end. Yeah. And uh, I was thinking it sounded a lot like something. Uh. That well, I mean, it's pop. It's kind of popular. It's coming back, like um, the kind of, like the the band that does the music for uh, Stranger Things. Yeah. And uh. Another band called no, well I guess it's a band. I mean it's people you know that make music called Gunship. It's kind of like that uh-huh. too. Um, oh cool. Kind of like eighties video gamey. Ah okay. Um, synthesizer music. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, I hadn't thought of that. So yeah. My, uh, my brother gave me a two month subscription to Netflix for my birthday last week, so I can check out. Stranger Things oh, and yeah. uh, Daredevil and stuff. That's what his thinking was. Yeah, definitely check out Stranger Things because you, um, you've been to the town that I, I grew up in called Fairburn yeah. in Georgia. Right. And, and a lot of uh, Stranger Things is, is filmed in that area in uh, a town called Palmetto that's like right down the road from it. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Dude, oh, let me, look, look, I have to tell you. I mean, I might have said this before, but I grew up in that area, right? Yeah. So they there's a grocery store called Brad, Bradley's Big Buy, and it's, you know, it's just a independent family-run grocery store. Um I mean, I think. I mean, it might have got bought yeah. out, but still kept the same name. Anyway, so, we used to go, like, after, sometimes after school, or after my mom would get off of work, we would go to Bradley's and get something before we went home, right? Mm-hmm. So, I had this visual of back then when I was a kid. I can see, you know, I can remember it, right? So, here's Stranger Things, and, <laughs> and they show, and it takes place in the 80s, and that's, you know, I grew up half in the 80s and half in the 90s. So... Um, so here's Stranger Things taking place in the 80s in the parking lot in the front of Bradley's Big Buy 
and all these cars look just like it did in the 80s. Yeah. Bradley's big body has never changed. That's <laughs> always looked the same. It's even got the same little um, quarter operated little kid little... rides and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but when I saw that scene in the movie, it's not like you were seeing something like I remember that. It was like yeah. looking back in time. Like I could, I saw uh -huh. that like for real. Th that type of scene, those t those right. cars, the front of Bradley's big bike. That time, I, I saw so, it. So I Bradley's it. is still there. Yeah, I lived yeah. it, and then I was like reliving it because I remembered it. So, well, it's, it's not like I was like watching the show. It's like I was actually looking back in time when I saw that that part. Uh, cool. But, yeah. So, I'll have to check it out. And not just because of that, but that that's uh, a huge thing for me on that show, but that show is also really awesome, it, just on its own. <clears throat> that's funny. Yeah, it, it, All right, well, um, that's that's good stuff. Yeah. Let's let's wrap it up here, because we're, we're hitting time. How's that coming there, page 109? It's coming along. Did they, were they... Yeah, were they dancing to the to the dance mix? <laughs> <laughs> they could be. They could be, but they weren't. They're not. But they were. Uh, what's <laughs> going? Doesn't, that's the rock. Yeah, they were. They were dancing, but then like the power got cut and the house lights came on, and then Bobby blew, blew away the bad guys with his his. Uh, Divine sound energy, and now the bad guys are flying back for revenge. So they're flying over these guys, and they're like, "What's going on? Maybe I can touch them, you know, that kind of thing." So, like the the ones on the right, right where you are, is that because the spotlight is on, or you haven't got there yet? They're they're like under a blue. Oh, I haven't got there yet. Color. Yeah. Okay. That's just the background. Gotcha. I did this. Uh, I did this um, gradient for for the whole for the background, and I just did gotcha. it over everything, and then colored over that. See, so here's part of the gradient on the side. I have to erase that. So, but cool. one more thing about Slash's comments about um, uh, rock going underground. And this yeah. this goes back to what we we've we've talked about this in the past. Is rock dying? Is you know is it gonna? Is there not gonna be any more rock? So I listened to Hype Machine. It's like right. a, it's a it's a music blog aggregator in whichever you know songs get the most posts on music blogs. They get into the popular stream on uh, Hype Machine. And lately, I've heard more guitar music, really? more guitar rock, indie rock on there than I, I ever have before. So Really? Yeah. That's encouraging. Yeah. So, whatever people say, like, something's going to die. All right, well, good stuff. Yep. Let's wrap it up for tonight. All right. And um, next time we'll talk about the remix uh, album. Yeah. All right. Yeah.